didn't get quite this turnout, so it's it's great um, to have a huge interest. And I think you're, you're obviously a, it's hard to tell by age anymore, but I think all of you must be in, probably a lot of you in senior class or are any in, in pre pre clinical. No a mixture of both. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I'm the intern network coordinator for Dublin Northeast. So the reform of the intern year in Ireland happened about, I suppose, two or three years ago, up to five years ago is when the report started, whereby be prior to this, uh, the medical schools used to appoint people directly to interim posts and really uh, around the different reviews and reforms, um, that was changed to a national matching system. So basically it's 522 posts in the country and they're matched similarly to what this, the way the CEO system works uh, for anyone that's done leaving search here before. And around that was also a lot of change around the education and assessment of interns and trying to make it more of an educational or postgraduate educational experience rather than just um, a working slog, I suppose. Um, so basically, for opportunities in Ireland, obviously the first decision, as, as Professor McGee just uh, kind of mentioned, is what to do once you leave medical school, what to do once you finish your your medical degree and obviously the first decision you need to make and uh, being RTSI students is are you going to stay in Ireland to, to do your intern year and if you do decide to stay what are your chances of getting a job here and, and that, that's important and um, because around this uh, the application process there has been some changes in how people are appointed okay so probably one of the most important documents and I know it looks big and you have a lot of reading to do but anyone that's actually planning to stay in Ireland whether you're from EU non-EU or EEA or non-EEA should look through this document. It's, it's a second interim report on the intern year, and we're going to put it up on the Moodle website, I think, Alice, is it? Yeah. And it's quite bulky, but it's worth reading the executive summary in that, and that'll give you a fair idea of A, where the posts are, and B, what are your chances of actually getting a post, an interim post, if you apply for it. And also talks a bit about how the intern year may change. And I think, uh, from talking to Professor McGee earlier today, there is going to be some big changes, I think, in the intern year over the next even year to 18 months and um, so it's important to keep an eye as the changes happen we let Alice know and it's obviously going to affect your chances and hopefully improve your chances those of you who want to stay and um, who are non-EU who want to stay here in Ireland to do the intern year okay so my plan today is to go through the intern process and then just give a little brief outline on my own specialty was a surgery and if you do start, plan to stay on after intern year into postgraduate and what, what the actual career path might look like and I'll also dabble in a little bit about medicine. I'm not going into too much about abs and gynae, peds, psych, because they've all varied our GP, but I'll just give you a brief idea of what, what it might be like. But I suppose mo what I could say to you is most people who stayed on as interns this year have matched to postgraduate programs in surgery, medicine, or psych. And um, some obviously have gone back to, to North America and Malaysia, but anyone who wants to stay looks like they've got, gotten what they've wanted in Ireland. Okay, <coughs> so basically they reform the intern year moved from medical school based to more network based um, and there's a single intake in July every year before we used to and um, for people who, who for qualified for different reasons in September and um, there will be a second small intake in January but the idea is to have a single intake in July of every year and there's a national matching system so basically you apply nationally you give your top 25 choices and then you rank your networks okay Again, I just put this on the slide so that when it's uploaded onto the Moodle website, you can actually hit this and go into the HSC website for more information. So basically, these are the networks. And <coughs> the basically, the networks are... The networks are actually organized around medical schools. So you have basically here Dublin Southeast. You have Dublin Northeast, which is uh, our network, which is the RCSI network, which also includes Waterford. So we're responsible for the interns in Beaumont, Drogheda, uh, Blanchestown, and, and Waterford. And it is kind of linked around the medical schools. Um, and then you've got uh, West Northwest, you've got the uh, Midwest, you've got the Southeast, and you've got here, as I said, Dublin Southeast. So you've Trinity, um, UCD, um, NUIG, University of Limerick, and then UCC potential on the other networks. Um, so when you're applying, you put your top 25 choices, and then you put your network choice. And if you don't get your first 25 choices, then you move on to your network choice, you'll get into your network choice, you go into, you go into clearing. Um, and as I said, the application, the application process starts around September of each year. So <coughs> the application process, eligibility criteria, so obviously you need a medical degree. 
There's a whole application process that starts in February and September. It starts in October this year, a little bit later. Um, and that's probably one of the first important dates. If you, do, if you don't um, register your interest in October, then you can't proceed to the MATSI application process. You might think, who's that going to happen to? We've had two students this year, for, for various reasons, who missed the initial expression of interest. And I think we've managed to sort out one student because of a problem with an email, and the other student hasn't been able to apply. And again, I have a link down here, which will be on the slides, which will be loads on Moodle for basically frequently asked questions around medical counseling and registration. Okay. Um, I suppose the, the important thing is due to European Union law, um, all EEA citizens have to be get offered a job prior to non-EEA. And obviously, you know, that causes some some concerns, I suppose, around the application process for a lot of people who are, who are sitting here today. Um, that's currently, we're bound by European law to do that um, when you've got an open competition and matching process. The actual matching process may be changing over the next two to three years, whereby there may be an interview included in that. Um, there's some talk about perhaps um, moving more towards the postgraduate training year, which might be part of your medical skills. There's a lot of changes around that. So I keep an open mind around this at the moment, uh, particularly for the non-EEA students. I keep a very open mind uh, and watch the careers website because there are changes coming along. So what happens <coughs> when once you match to the program, you're then registered with the Y College Surgeons as a, as a, as a postgraduate pseudo student, and you, you sign an intern training agreement uh, with ourselves. And in that ter intern training agreement, what actually happens is you, you promise, or at least give some sort of a promise to attend 80% of the lectures that we give, which are held once a week during the actual year. There are also clinical skills <coughs> sessions that are run throughout the year. We've run one last weekend in Beaumont where we had 82 interns. Um, and basically, that's practical skills training that perhaps you wouldn't get um, um, within medical school. It's dealing with um, NIPI ventilators for respiratory patients, advanced ECG interpretation, medical legal, um, dealing with a difficult patient, communications, breaking bad news, talking to families. And it was split into four modules and uh, also blood transfusion and reversal of anticoagulation. It basically hit on areas that during the year the intern reps came to us and said, look, this is something we feel a little bit lax in, can we have some extra tuition in? So we brought everyone in for the day, we split them into groups of, of, uh, of six, and they rotated around kind of an OSCE type station where you did these extra actual tasks. And before you even start your intern year, we do a an um, induction week whereby you're brought through clinical skills. A lot of you would have done during the actual um, final med, um, but basically bring you through again uh, cannulation, urinary catheterization, ND tube insertion, uh, ABGs. Um, we walk you around the different hospitals that you're in and you shadow an intern, um, which actually most of the, uh, in, you know, the interns from this year said it's probably the most valuable part of the day. And um, it's just A, to make sure that you're happy with the clinical skills, and B, to identify those people who want extra actual tuition through the year. <coughs> so our responsibility is to deliver the National Intern Training Program to you. It's led by the intern coordinator. We're responsible of looking at all sites to, to make sure the education training is equal to all. And we agree an education program for interns. And because this is an evolution, we are heavily influenced by what the feedback is from the intern <coughs> groups. There's been huge changes between uh, July to last year, between July last year to this year, and there's a lot more emphasis on clinical skills, stuff that probably can't be taught in, in medical school level or in UCP. And um, we've actually got an intern tutor, Gazi Ophaya, who some of you might know. She's a graduate of, of, of RCSI, who's about five, six years out, who's actually taken individual interns back onto the wards and dealt with individual issues that they may have at a practical level, which again is difficult to do in medical school. Really what I'm trying to get across to you is that this is probably a polishing off, a finishing of your, of your medical school training, and it's more practical based. And so it is really uh, be a benefit to you going up abroad. And I, I just looking around at some of the speakers, uh, we're all RCSI, or most of the RCSI graduates here who then went off to uh, North America or the UK. And actually having the intern year done and going abroad has actually been a huge benefit um, to North Americans and to ourselves because you've got those extra practical skills. Um, so basically also liaise with, with HR and the hospitals about jobs. So <coughs> I know you've, you've, some of you are, are, are personally involved as well in mentorship programs in the clinical years to students. Um, and this could be highly beneficial to people. So basically in each of the hospitals we have intern tutors 
who are at senior consultant level, this is Professor Gillen, who some of you may know, who's probably been a surgeon now for over 25 years. He's the intern tutor in Gohada and, and meets with the interns every three months. Is there to deal with any particular issues you may have. Um, and again, there's only 50 or 16 interns in Gohada, so you have a direct access to, to, to Professor Gillen uh, from a mentorship point of view. Uh, in Conley Hospital, this is um, part of the healing, which uh, unfortunately <coughs> retired in February of this year. But again, he was acting as the intern tutor. We're currently looking for a new intern tutor in Conley Hospital. And again, it works in the same way. And then a Water Region Hospital, I have managed to get Professor McGee in here. It's not her, but uh, over here is where the there, Simon Cross, again, surgeon that's been there for about 15 years, who's quite experienced. And again, is a direct link for the interns there. And then you've got Shane O'Neill and Beaumont, who I think most people here will know, is the intern tutor who, again, there's 65 interns in Beaumont. And so both myself and Shane share this role within Beaumont to try and give you more access. But again, you've got this mentorship program throughout the intern year, career advice. And this year, we've run a careers evening earlier in the year for people who are thinking about staying in Ireland for postgraduate training. And, and we've got GPs in psychiatry, medicine, and surgery. Um, and we also do interview practice, and uh, we're, next year we're planning to do some CV preparation. So again, it's a polishing off or finishing of some of the stuff that you may not get to do within medical school. <coughs> this is just some of the stuff we looked at. We look at your attendance in the workplace. You might think this is strange, but we have had some interns who start on day one, decide they've had enough after three days and need to take a few days off. Um, it is getting you ready for, for, for actually a working environment where actually you do have to turn up. Um, I'm sure in RTSI you still have to turn up, uh, but uh, and also organising intern lectures once a week. What do you need to get through the year? It's very simple. Last year we'd only one intern who actually didn't want to do medicine, who, who didn't make it through, and that person was quite happy with that. It, it, it's really a year whereby we're guided educationally by yourselves. All we want is four satisfactory assessments, which is on three monthly. So after, after each three months, you meet with your intern tutor discuss any issues, and the vast majority, 98% of people are signed off at that three-month interval and, and, and have no issues. And so again, just to, to say that this is a further honing of your clinical skills, gets used to doing a full day's uh, work and on call, and it also gives you a, an insight into the different specialties within the hospital. We also, a lot of our CSI students would have done this already, but actually we take in students from um, all over Europe uh, at this stage and not everyone has BLS and ACLS. We also teach this COMPASS, um, which is the early warning score system for patients, for the acute ill patients. You know, during Mishri sitting there going, we did, we've done that in the UK for the last 10 years, we're only doing it in Ireland for the last 18 months. Um, but this is an early war warning score system, which is useful for an assessment of uh, communication of sick patients. An alarm is uh, basically a medical legal um, chart, note taking, and um, writing medical reports. Um, and again, some, some issues of communication and consent. And again, the intern reps are very important to us. We have four intern reps within the network who feed back to us on a regular basis. And they're very, they really dictate what happens during the intern year to, to a certain extent. We have a set curriculum of what we need to do. There's an online program that you need to take part in. <coughs> but overall, if an intern rep <coughs> group comes to us and say, actually, look, we have great difficulty, uh, let's say, interpreting ECGs, which I hope you won't have, but and we can then take the, you know, those group of interns or even on an extra session. But I have to say, at, at this stage, the intern reps, a lot of them are the same as around career advice, a bit like today. And so this is a continuing process as you go through medical school and out. And as I said, the first important decision is, are you going to stay in Ireland, do an internship or not? I'd like to encourage most of you who, who, who are here to try and at least consider it. And obviously, uh, based on some of the information that I'm going to give you in the next few minutes, decide whether you need a backup plan. It's always good to have a backup plan. We've all been in situations whereby you felt you were going to swan into a job and then and then didn't, or for whatever reasons, and the job didn't become available. So what happens at the end of the intern year, we give a certificate experience, well, sorry, we recommend you for a certificate experience in medical council, which allows you to get full registration. So the recommendation is made by and myself, the intern network coordinator, based on your assessments and based on feedback from the tutors, and then that's sent to the medical school, and then they give you the certificate of experience, um, which allows you to go for full registration. Um, so again, this is the report that I showed you there. It was only published on Tuesday. And <coughs> how the system works is the Medical Council are the ones who award certificate of experience. They're saying, you know, you now are fully registered as a doctor, and they look after a lot of professional issues around intern year. The Health Service Executive, which is the HSE, which has been disbanded, 
over the last few months, but basically there'll be something on the face page. They fund the intern year. So they pay the intern salaries, and they also um, pay for your education. So they pay the RCSI to deliver education. The other thing that they also do in, in a roundabout way, so they get their money from the Department of Finance. Okay? The Department of Finance partially funds your places here uh, in medical school. So recently what they've looked at is, well, we're putting this much money into medical schools, what are we getting out of it? And what they've actually realized is, um, there's around, and I can be corrected, I don't see Hannah here at the moment, I think there's around 10, uh, 1,000 graduates per year, isn't it, in the country? 1,200. Yeah, 1,200. Yeah, there's 1,200 graduates per year coming out of medical schools in Ireland. There's 525 intern posts. There's a huge mismatch there. So they're putting money into your careers in medical school, <coughs> and they're not being able to provide it to the vendor. They're not getting the feedback. They're not getting the work part back out of it. So they realize this. And basically, they've admitted there's insufficient numbers of interim training places to pay for government fund events and education training. So basically, they're putting lots of money in at undergrad level, and then 700 of you are leaving the country uh, with that investment and using it elsewhere. Now, I think certain of you would do it for personal reasons and whatever, but um, basically, this is very important. So basically, what they're trying to say here is they're going to increase the number of interim posts. There is talk of increasing the interim posts by up to 300, okay, up to, up to about a head under places. That's their aim. How they do that, I don't know, with a hot of the country. They have to borrow more money from the UK, maybe, to do it, <coughs> or China. Or China. Um, but there are, there, are different, uh, there are different mechanisms out there that they're looking at to try and increase the number of interim posts. And the reason I'm saying this to you now is that this could happen fairly quickly. This could happen over a period of six months to a year. So people who felt that they may not have been offered a post previously uh, may be in a position where they'll be offered a post. So it's, it's very important to keep a close eye on this. And as, as I hear it, I'll pass it on to Alice and, and we'll see how things go. So basically, this is some of the raw data from the report. So um, in 2010, and there was, if you look at the number of interns, 411 were from EEA and 131 non-EEA, increased to 500, <coughs> sorry, applicants. And in 2011, there was 500 applicants, uh, EEA, 277 non-EEA. And then last year, in the year that we're currently in, uh, 546 EEA applicants, 271. So I suppose this is a little bit worrying, okay? And you can see the number of applicants has, has increased significantly over the three years. And this is a combination of the fact that the, the reform of the intern year is, is allowing, you can have your own opinions on it, people who qualify from European universities come back into Ireland to do internship. So maybe Irish people who have gone abroad who are coming back, or non-Irish who are abroad and are coming into Ireland <coughs> to try and access postgraduate education. <coughs> That's a fairly significant number. It's still less than the number of graduates. Um, but um, if we look at this number, about 150 of these are coming from outside of Ireland, uh, as in other words, applying from outside of Ireland to come back in. Not huge numbers, but there is a significant number. And um, let's see. So if you look at the project very well, but so basically, how do how do we do in the Dublin Northeast? Well, basically, the people that applied to Dublin Northeast, 71 percent of our network, 71 percent people applied got their one of the top 25 choices. And you can go down here and you can see that some of the networks were at the Midwest, only 30% of the people applied to the Midwest got their first top 25 choice. And, and then you're here at around 85% for West Northwest. So if you look at people who applied to our network, 71% got their top 25 choice, 30% didn't. That doesn't mean 71% got a job. And the one thing here we want to say is that all RCSI applicants, and I can confirm this with Alice, in 2011 got offered a post. So anyone from RCSI last year, not 2005, 2011, who applied, got offered a post. Not everyone took it up. One person decided not to tell us they weren't taking it up, or two, which is a huge problem for us. So if, if you are matching to a program and you're not going to take the job, you have to let us know because we have to make that job available for someone else. You know, and it, you know, so basically, this particular post is in Sligo, and all of us who've worked around the country will know that there's six interns in Sligo, as far as I know, six. Six in total, sorry, six in surgery. Uh, so basically, they got from one in six on call to one in five. Someone was on holiday, they got to one in four. So that has huge implications to some of the smaller hospitals. We don't turn up. So we need to know if we're not going to turn up. And allocation to posts. Uh, so this is the national, the 555 from last year. So 428 people were of EEA and 127. So 23% 
or non EEA that are, that are basically currently interns and non from over. And you know, the OIA arts and So in our in our network, and 69% are EEA and 31% are non EEA. Okay. Uh, so where are they now? That's another thing that the second intern report goes through. So I suppose it shows that for personal reasons or whatever, I think it's good to do the intern year. 51% of people who completed their intern year last year, so 2011, are currently in postgraduate training in Ireland. All the rest are outside, so 49% are outside Ireland. Okay. Where did the vast majority can go? Okay, this place. 38% went to Australia. 38% of people who left went to Australia or New Zealand. And they were asked, you go to the document yourself, but they were asked why and for lifestyle issues. And what we find is, particularly we've seen this with nursing maybe five, ten years ago, the vast majority of people who go to Australia from Ireland who are EU, EU graduates or non EU graduates, sorry, who are EU graduates, and tend to come back after a year or two. And we're actually trying to facilitate those people who went to Australia for a year after internship by organising interviews for the schemes, either by teleconference. I'd much prefer to fly over there and interview them, but I'm not sure that's going to be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. First class, okay, great. <laughs> so basically, we're, we're going to try and facilitate those people who go to Australia for that year break and, and for lifestyle issues and get a bit of a tan, maybe do a bit of surfing. And then by doing the interviews for the surgical schemes and the medical schemes over in Australia or doing by teleconference in Sydney, Perth, and like the Perth Centre of Brisbane, we're going to try and set up as well. So we're trying to interview people, so if you do go away, we're trying to encourage you back. But the vast majority of those 38% will return, unless they're originally from that region, they will return. Um, but it does give you a good setup uh, for, for postgraduate. I'm just going to very briefly go through, I think, as Hannah said at the very beginning, the most important decision you need to make today, or not today, from today, is are you going to stay in Ireland to do your intern year, or are you going to go back? Um, as I said, um, there'll be some of you um, who may be a little bit, you know, will I, you know, putting your eggs in one basket, you may not be offered a post. Things may be changing over the next 18 months to a year, so it may be very relevant for some of you. So basically, internships a year <coughs> in Ireland for a body go through four, three months. You come to our network, four, three months um, sessions, three months general surgery, three months of medicine, three months specialty. Um, or it's like six months of specialty. So um, there are some good rotations we look through. And um, one of the websites I gave you there is actually a list of the actual intern rotations. The most popular rotations in our network at the moment include uh, A and E anesthetics, A and E anesthetics, and uh, we're going to have psychiatry at the after psychiatry, and the medical assessment unit. They've been the most popular. And um, anesthetics in particular, you do three months of anesthetics, that be probably six weeks into the job. No anesthesia here, is there? No. no. Six months into the job, <laughs> this is be fully trained. <laughs> six weeks, sorry, six weeks. And um, I suppose so. If, we, if I take the example of the current intern, so I do it. I do it this twice a week in Beaumont on Tuesday and a Thursday. And uh, last Thursday, I turned around, and looked up, and there was the intern uh, giving the anaesthetic to, to the patients. So, and she's been in the job about six weeks. Now she's at the end of her intern year, so she's done nine months of internship. But they felt confident enough to leave her. She put patients asleep. She ran an anaesthetic, and um, they came in obviously the patient was people went up, but she was there for most of it. So anaesthetics in particular has been a great success for us um, from the interim point of view. So then you go into your basic training. Uh, medicine is two years BST here in Ireland, and surgery is gone out to three years, so you do one year of a specialist. If you do two years uh, of FHO in, in surgery, uh, where you do at least six months in either A and E or orthopedics. And, and then in your third year, you speak your specialist year. It's trying to encourage people who want to get a, a taste of ENT or vascular or orthopedics if you haven't done it, and to do a full year in your specialist to prepare you for HST. And this has always been the problem uh, in surgery, and this is something that's constantly changing, and, and I think probably led to on as well. Jerry went through it. And then basically, it's the gap years that we talked about before HST. We're trying to narrow this in the surgical scheme at the moment. And we're trying to make research less important. Now, I don't mean clinical research, I mean lab based PhDs and MDs. There was a time where you could not get from here to here uh, without an MD okay, or a PhD. And there's things within college now or within the surgical section, postgraduate, that really that's no longer an, uh, should be a requirement. 
and that clinical years should count for almost the same as what about a research year. Now, they would encourage you some research, but not all in your third year. The plan eventually is to drop this out altogether and you go from basic training in three years straight into higher surgical training. But maybe there might be two to four years here. And again, the opportunities are good uh, for going from an internship to, to DST. And I don't have the data at the moment, but last year, 90% of the people who applied off the post. I'm not sure what it is this year. Um, and then higher specialist training. I, I suppose the one thing I'd say about higher specialist training in Ireland, from having gone through it myself in surgery and Jerry went through it in medicine, I don't know if she went through it in, radio, you went through it in radiology. And if you plan to stay this long, the options are still wide open to you. Okay. If I take my own my own career, I went through all the pathways, I did an MD here, went on to higher surgical training, did five years here in Ireland and um, between Cork, a place called Castlebar, and more Castlebar. <laughs> All right, you won. Who's the male? Yeah, yeah, we're not, not admitting to it. I spent a year in Casa Bar, which was great. And uh, so after four years, I applied for a fellowship in Toronto. So I went to Toronto for just over two years. And it is true, once once you get, once I got to Toronto, um, you have a very slightly different training that's there. And you find you're about two or three years older than um, your counterpart. Um, so you're two or three years more mature. <laughs> You hope. Um, but basically, with this training, it's a huge asset to you, as Alice was saying. And um, if you do stay this long, and you might say, well, look, I'm Canadian, I want to go back to Canada anyway. So I went there in 2000, I came back in 2000, and I'm thinking 2010, and um, was offered a, a, a consultant post there. And um, Dr. Carr, who's here, is still working with consultants over in Chicago. The two people who followed me um, are now are what we call consultants, our staff. Uh, on staff, anyone from, anyone from Toronto? Yeah, one is on staff in Toronto General Hospital. Uh, and then Tony Maloney is Graham Rochnagel, who's a graduate two years behind me, is, is on staff in Toronto General. And then you have um, Tony Maloney on staff in St. Mike's, the Urban Angel. And uh, we have another graduate going over there this year, who, depending on things, will probably stay. So basically, you are highly trained in your leader, you are highly respected. A lot of you would have done a lot of MDs. So if you are, you know, if you, if you, it depends which level you want to move off at, but if you do stay for higher surgery training, that doesn't stop you from going back to your own country to practice and actually probably prepared you quite well. All right, um, got on a little bit, so let's just get through this very quickly. Um, so basically, there is an egg examination um, in surgery, um, which is run by all the colleges. It's the fellowship and um, <coughs> FRCSI, Fellowship in Surgery, which is, uh, gives you what we call CCST, Completion of Training. Um, and we've got good things for Fellowship, and they are highly respected abroad. You can take your opinions from everyone else here. Important dates for those people who are applying for internships, September, October, you need to prepare your interest in the internship. All you do is fill out the form, send it in. If you're not even particularly thinking about it, I would still do it. I would still have, you know, because things may even change. We've had experience where things have changed between July and even January. And we're already at the stage where this year's final meds, or SE2, have applied and they're actually making their choices. And I had an email last week from the HSE saying there could be 40 extra posts for this July. So, you know, this is how much is changing our fast of it. And the SE schemes, um, but they're usually applied for around January time um, of each year. But, but if you're in the intern system, that will become the word we get around. And we have got quality programs in, in all the postgraduate and, and disciplines. How will you complete group <coughs> participation if you want to stay here for postgraduate surgery? I find it very difficult for people to leave to their internships outside of Ireland and then come back. There, there's a huge problem around paperwork. And before we could say to you going abroad, yes, that internship is, is recognized. Because the Medical Council have changed the rules, you now go away, do your internship, and then come back and try and get it recognized. And my experience is that it can take up to two, two and a half years to do that. You know, So you've been away for the year, and then you apply saying, I've done this, this, and this, I've worked with these people in this, or probably an exit institution, but it can take your medical council up to two years to recognize that internship. So I really don't think it's an option at the moment. We're trying to fast track it by getting the medical council to say, these hospitals are approved for internship outside of Ireland, but we haven't got to that stage yet. Um, you haven't got to that stage yet. Um, clinical research at undergrad and intern level. This is something that, you know, when I went through college myself, I didn't do any clinical research at this level, and I really regret it. If you're in uh, undergraduate 
and there's a good clinical research project. It might take two or three weeks to go through part of your student selected mode, SSC, hmm? IC3. And it's very important if you do do good clinical research to go the full whack and get it published. Even, I shouldn't say even, uh, the student journal is somewhere where you can get it published, Art Journal of Medical Science. And you might think, well, you know, it couldn't be bothered. That to you would mean a huge amount when we come out the far side as regards not unfortunately getting on the internship programs, getting on the postgraduate programs, either here or abroad. And so again, all our time for 2011. I'm not sure what's going to happen this year, but I'll update you. And good opportunities in the PST and HST. I suppose it's great to have a careers day like today. And it seems to be highly organized, and that's great. And you've got good speakers coming after me, unfortunately. And, but basically, what's important is you're all graduates of RCSI. Throughout RCSI, you would met people who have gone before you and people who are coming behind you. And probably the best people to talk to are the guys that are about two or three years ahead of you to get advice because things are constantly changing. You know, when I came to by the end of my HST, I found this with the Cleveland Clinic in, in the US. Things changed slightly, Toronto opened up, and someone had gone there from Belfast ahead of me who was an RCSI graduate. So I followed him over there. You might think that's a very loose connection, but actually, no matter how structured schemes are, that's that's the way things go, you know. So it's very important to have conversations with the guys that are two or three years ahead of you, and because they've been through the path. And unfortunately, you can see how they've succeeded, but you can also see how they've made mistakes, and you know, and that they'll highlight to that to the loopholes. And because even if I look around the room, and I followed an RCSI graduate, three have followed me. I know David Boucher Hayes is here behind me. He Richie Power followed him to Australia. Is now consulting back in Beaumont. So that you know there is there is that kind of loose connection which is not formal, but because you're uh, you know there is that RCSI connection, it's important to talk to those that are heavier. All right, listen. Thanks very much.